All right. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Ari. Um, he uh, received his PhD in statistics from Stanford uh, with David Donahoe. He held a postdoc position at uh, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics and the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. Um, then he joined faculty in, in the mathematics department at UCSD in 2005, and his uh, research um, has been on high dimensional statistics, machine learning, and applied probability. And he is especially well known for his work on detection and minimax hypothesis testing, unsupervised learning, um, and uh, denoising in, in uh, signal and image processing. And we're very happy to have him today. Um, please. Thank you, Sasha. So um, let me just share my screen then. Okay. So can you can you see this thing? Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about. Me, the screen is a bit busy here. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, some work I've done over the last few years on that sort of involved that sort of tied together on by by having distances play a crucial role, uh, and it's in collaboration with a number of talented people, including uh, Thibaut, who uh, somehow is in the audience. Uh, I just saw him, and um, so I'll, I'll, without further ado, let me start on. Uh, so it's a collection of projects again tied together. Um, in that way. I'm going to start with uh, the problem of estimating positions from distances. <clears throat> it's, it has various names. Uh, graph embedding is one of them. Multidimensional multi scaling is another one. Graph realization, graph drawing, uh, sensor network localization. Um, it's an important problem that has been uh, for uh, quite a long time with a pretty long history uh, from the at least 1950s uh, with work by uh, Togerson. I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, so here's the, the problem, roughly speaking, and this is uh, vaguely stated. Uh, so we're given a uh, weighted graph. Uh, v is a node set, E is the edge set, and delta is uh, the weight uh, function on, on the edges. And, um, and we are also given a uh, target dimension tool D, which is often two for visualization purposes. And the goal is to find points in space, uh, y, y, uh, through y, n, uh, in RD, such that uh, their pairwise Euclidean distances are approximately equal to the corresponding edges, uh, edge weights when uh, the points are uh, indexed accordingly. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm just here not assuming you don't know much about this, so uh, I'm going to just go through some basics. Uh, so, for example, the first thing I want, might want to try is to uh, essentially take the two quantities that we are after. Uh, so, the European distances and uh, the weights, uh, corresponding weights, and simply, you know, essentially put them all together in some uh, loss function. I know that the sum is over the uh, existing edges. And in fact, this has been proposed before, and it's uh, sometimes known as uh, nonmetric scaling in the uh, statistics literature. But it's uh, you know sort of a nasty problem to solve. It's uh, highly non-convex and such, so um, it's definitely not only only a starting point, not not the end of the story at all. So, like I said, the the problem has uh, multiple names, and uh, there are important connections to a uh, nearest neighbor search and uh, embedding of biometric space, although in that area people use more sophisticated tools for mathematics, typically. And, and also there's a tight connection with manifold learning, which I'll, I'll come back to a bit later. Okay, so when the graph is complete, meaning all edge weights are available, uh, there is an exact solution if an exact solution can be found. And it, it can be found by uh, solving essentially uh, by matrix decomposition, essentially in, in SVD. Uh, and the method is uh, known as a classical scaling and uh, is the one that uh, Togerson uh, came up with in the 1950s. So here it goes. Um, so this is a particular, this is the most well known algorithm for this problem, but again requires that all uh, pairwise distances be available. So we have the distances and embedding dimensional D. And then again, the goal is to find a set of points that satisfy the pairwise distance constraints. 
And um, I guess so the idea is the following. We are given the distances. Uh, what we do is recover the inner products by double centering the, um, the distance matrix, which essentially corresponds to the weight matrix in the formulation, the graph formulation that I gave earlier. And you know this is just simple uh, algebra that you learn when when you when you learn about you know Euclidean uh, spaces, and but this is in matrix form here. But that's all you do. You go from uh, uh, Euclidean distances to inner products. Once you are in, in uh, inner products, then you're faced with an, a gram matrix, which you then therefore want to uh, decompose in the Cholesky fashion. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what you can do with an SGD if you want. And um, so in more detail <clears throat> here, uh, in fact, this is diagonal, it's a uh, eigen decomposition because the matrix is, uh, is uh, symmetric. So you look at the eigenvalues of this double center matrix. There should be a two here actually. And, um, and then uh, corresponding eigenvectors and just normalize the eigenvectors properly, put them into columns and the n rows uh, provide us with the embeddings. So that's the classical scaling algorithm. So again, suggesting the 50 is uh, very popular, uh, likely the, the most used by far, just like PCA. And, and uh, even then, uh, its robustness to noise uh, was not super well known. So that's something we came up with. There was earlier work by uh, Simpson in the late 70s and a bit more recently by uh, De Silva and uh, Josh Tenenbaum in 2004 in a uh, somehow unpublished technical report. We, obtain, we actually obtain a true uh, perturbation bound with Adele de Van Mar and Bruno Pelletier. Uh, what we do is actually, let me walk through the uh, setting. So we have a cent, uh, center points that the fact that the center is not essential, but uh, just for convenience, because the algorithm that I just described, classical scaling, returns a centered uh, point set. So uh, you start with the, uh, with the point set y1 through yn. And um, so we assume it has a radius. Uh, this is half of the diameter rho and half width omega. And delta ij are the pairwise Euclidean distances. And then, OK. So the, the deltas are the true pairwise distances. The lambdas are going to be the noisy ones. And then this sort of measures how much noise there is. This eta does that. And if eta is small enough compared to the half width of the point set, then, uh, then we have this bound on what classical scaling recovers. So classical scaling cannot recover the exact point set no matter what, because it's up to a uh, rigid transformation. We only have pairwise distances after all, which are you know, of course invariant with respect to uh, rigid transformations. So therefore, we cannot hope to recover the, uh, the points that we can only hope to recover it up to a uh, rigid transformation. So because the points that is centered uh, by rigid transformation, I mean the orthogonal group here. And uh, anyway, so this sort of result is hard to parse when you're reading it, but uh, it's relatively simple intuitively just saying that if you know, this is the noise level eta, the overall noise level in the distances, and although we have some noise in, in this, it is the, uh, the quality of the recovery de uh, degrades uh, gracefully. There's, you know, like, so this is the quality of the recovery. And, uh, and then it's bound by a function of eta. So, okay. Ari, uh, yeah. uh, this is Philip Rigoli. I have a couple questions. The first one yeah. is, what, what is the half width? And the second one is, so this is for worst case noises where you're just looking yeah. at the average. Uh, can we hope to get better bounds if, for example, we assume that the noise is like Gaussian or something like this? Yeah, so this is uh, other work by, um, uh, his name is Casey now, I think his, uh, his last name is Sun, and I think he's in Toronto, who uh, has uh, more recent work with, uh, that has like a final work that involves random matrix theory. So when you assume that there's randomness, you can hope to get uh, much more precise results. Yeah. So this is just a perturbation bound a la, you know, Davis Kahan for, you know, like uh, eigenspaces. Yeah. And the other question, where is the half width? So uh, rho is uh, the half diameter, so the radius. So, so okay. And the half width is um, the the um, the width of the uh, narrowest band that contains a point set. 
And, and the band is simply uh, made of two uh, hyper, hyper planes parallel to each other. Okay, thanks. Does that makes sense? Okay. All right, so we, we got, uh, and then in the same paper, we, we talked about uh, how to apply this to obtaining results for ISO map, uh, one of the uh, most iconic uh, methods for manifold learning. I don't know if I talk about it later in the, paper, in the, in the talk here, but there's a, uh, that's the connection with uh, graph distances. I think I actually talk about it a bit later. Okay, so this is all good when um, at least robust to, when I say robust, it's more like a, you know, stability to noise. Uh, I'm not talking about the outliers here. Um, but this, uh, this method, classical scaling, requires knowledge of uh, the availability of all distances, even though possibly noisy. But what happens when some of the distances are missing, which tends to be the case in practice? So, um, it turns out there is actually a theory on uh, that build, that actually asks this kind of question. Uh, the one I'm tackling here is a more algorithmic part and methodology uh, part to the question. There is a more fundamental question where uh, you just look at the adjacency matrix of the graph without taking into account the weights and ask the question as to whether generically the graph can be embedded uniquely. And generically here means that essentially for almost all choices of uh, edge weights. Uh, I won't say too much more, but there's a whole theory on this called rigidity theory. And um, and it's closely related, although the detect the, again the problem at a different level. And then here we're more interested in actual actual methods. So the one we're actually going to talk about is how using graph distances to fill in the missing entries in the weight matrix, meaning the uh, we're going to use graph distances to uh, estimate uh, missing pairwise distances. And this actually idea uh, goes back to uh, uh, Kruskal and Siri in 1980. Uh, it actually took me a little while to discover this, even though the same method was rediscovered in, uh, by Sheng and Al in 2003, and then they suggested a uh, uh, variant a bit later and a few others. In fact, um, the I don't have it here for some reason, but the uh, isomap algorithm for manifold learning uh, fills in the missing or so-called the the, you know, the, uh, the distances uh, using exactly this method. And also that was also re in a sense rediscovered in 2000. So anyway, this is the simplest method we can think of, paths, and uh, that's the one we're going to study in more detail. But there are other methods uh, that people have suggested. Again, this is for the case where uh, we want to, same problem, we want to embed points, but some uh, uh, distances, pairwise distances are missing. So there's a somewhat greedy approach that does the following. It takes uh, a clique, meaning all uh, of uh, enough size, large enough size. So something has to be at least in dimension D. Uh, it has to be at least of size uh, D plus one, I think. And, uh, and then just because in a clique, all pairwise distances are, uh, are available, it just embeds that clique using classical scaling. And then uh, at each uh, iteration thereafter, it embeds uh, any available point uh, by uh, trial iteration. And trial iteration is essentially like a triangulation, but based on, uh, so it's positioning based on distances opposed to positioning based on angles. So a very intuitive method, very, very greedy and therefore susceptible to noise, although that, that hasn't been quantified as far as I know. And, um, and, the, and so there's another one uh, where um, instead of embedding just one click, one embeds a number of clicks enough that the clicks overlap the entire graph or cover the entire graph. And then one tries to so-called synchronize the clicks, meaning essentially align them all together because they have to live. So you start by embedding them in, in, as if uh, parallel spaces and then uh, you know sort of uh, stitch them together in the same space it's also a very intuitive one less greedy and uh, there are a few other techniques uh, that have to do more with uh, optimization so one is by majorization and the other one is by uh, semi-definite programming relaxation okay so let's focus on uh, graph distances from now on um, so uh, here is an illustration. So we have uh, points in space. Of course, those are not provided to us. What we have are the pairwise distances between points uh, that are uh, 
um, joined by an edge here. So imagine just having that. And, and then uh, imagine we want to know the distance or compute the distance between uh, the two endpoints here, so the square at the end here. And what this method does is uh, it just uh, computes the, the uh, shortest path distance in the graph. And uh, and this this is the truth. The, so in red is our estimate and purple truth. And we can see that it's gonna, I mean, intuitively it's gonna work. And uh, actually the proving that sort of thing is actually not very complicated. Let me walk through it. So, um, so again, delta are the, um, provides the uh, pairwise distances that are available, at least, so that are available. The graph distances, for well, most people here would know what they are, but anyway, uh, if you take two, uh, two points in the graph, two vertices in the graph i and j, so we look at all possible paths going from i to j, and then sum the weights along the way, and take the infimum over all uh, those things, uh, meaning uh, taking the infimum over all the paths of, of, the, uh, of their length, and this is called the length of the path. Okay, this is of course very classical in graph theory. And um, so here we're interested in particular graphs that are, uh, you know, to, to talk about consistency, we talk about, you know, actual, actual points in the background for which we have pairwise distances. Of course, we don't have the point, but we want to analyze the algorithm based on assuming that we have points that we can talk about uh, notions of consistency when, we, when, when our goal is to recover points. Okay, so, um, Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just laughing because there, there's a zoom that uh, hides part of the slide here, but anyway, I'll do what I can. So, um, okay, so uh, just a reminder that uh, E is the edge set and provides uh, an indication on when uh, a weight or a pairwise distance is available. And uh, here is a special case where that happens when the pairwise distance, when the pairwise distance is less than or equal to some R, okay? And this is typically what people call sensor network localization in engineering. So it's a special case, special variant of multi-dimensional multi scaling with missing entries when the entries are missing according to their magnitude, meaning the distances are missing according to whether they are less than or greater than some uh, threshold, this being the simplest case. And uh, so we have this result that sort of refines uh, existing results in the literature uh, there were other ones before us, including in a, a technical report, some somewhat famous technical report by the ISOMAP authors, um, that was there to essentially, uh, for them, justify the algorithm, uh, at least in a simple mathematical model. <coughs> so we we refer them bound and get the square here, as opposed to uh, not having a square, which was a difference. Although they, they do it in the curved situation, we do it in the uh, flat situation. Yeah, and let me walk through the results. We have a set of points x1 to xn, and those are the real ones. Uh, y1 through n are the ones that are returned by a method. That's how I, that's how the notation goes here. Epsilon is the density of the points inside their own convex uh, uh, hall, and convexity here plays an important role because we're using paths um, in the graph to estimate Euclidean distances. So um, if there is some, somehow the, uh, the XIs are not dense in their convex set, imagine if there's a hole, and then uh, we wouldn't be able to cover all, per, all you can distances accurately. Okay, so that's uh, the R, remember, is the connectivity radius of the graph, meaning uh, that gives us what distances are available. And when epsilon is uh, small enough relative to R, then we have that, uh, well, the first inequality here comes from the fact that in Euclidean space, the uh, straight lines or the, straight, the, the line segments are shortest. But the second part, uh, let's see if I can do it. This part right here is uh, non trivial uh, and uh, just provides a, uh, you know, a measure of performance on using uh, graph distances to estimate uh, Euclidean distances. Okay, so I went through this already. There was, there was another paper uh, by uh, Montanari, a small paper on um, on proving exactly the same thing in a similar context, but with uh, with a less precise bound, like I said. Mary, can I ask a quick question about yeah, this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the first uh, uh, thing is, um, so 
this uh, shortest path distance is always bias upward. Uh, is there, are there like, that there exists some techniques that people use to try to correct the bias to make sure that it's like more, you know, centered. So that's my first question. And my second mm -hmm. question is if I assume that my XIs are IID uh, in some uh, compact, uh, convex set, for example, uh, do I, uh, how, what is epsilon in this case? Uh, okay, so if you're in dimension D, then and if you're di full dimensional, right, then if is going to be on the order of uh, log n over n to power one over D. Yeah, so there's the curse of dimensionality here. I mean, obviously the method is local, so there's one for sure. Okay. And, yeah. and the second question was, do people try to correct for the bias? Like, are there any heuristics to correct for this bias? Yeah, I think that's what um, this other paper mentioned by um, by Sun, that uh, and collaborator, that um, they um, uh, they use tools from random matrix theory to understand. Um, so it's not exactly in the same context as here, but they are able in the context of uh, classical scaling to correct some bias that uh, they're able to show exists. I don't know. I think it was even perhaps even new uh, to their research, but to even know that there was a bias. But again, in a very particular setting, uh, but uh, and they go after the bias and, and indeed try to compensate for that. I wouldn't know how to do it here, but uh, it's possible you might be able to do it by assuming some randomness on the exercise. Uh, in the absolute, I don't think that's possible. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so moving on to something a bit different. Well, actually, not the context is a little bit different in that we are now on the surface, and then uh, soon enough we're going to consider uh, estimating uh, short path distance maybe with some constraints. So it's going to be a variant on this uh, basic problem we've been talking about, and this is joint work with uh, Thibault Le Guic, who is in the audience again. And um, so um, yeah, so in manifold learning. Um, so this is a situation where points are in space, but uh, not in uh, R little d, in the sense it's R big d, uh, quote unquote, meaning that like you're in high dimensional space in principle. And uh, you want to embed the points. Again, the, the, the problem is the same, but now you, you're sort of assuming to curve the, or to uh, avoid the curse of dimensionality, you assume that the points are in fact on the low dimensional surface somewhere in space. We only have available this, the, the points. So it seems a bit different because we it, we do have access to the points in manifold learning, but uh, in the, the situation happens to be quite similar in that we only trust the uh, shortest distances because that, those are the ones that uh, are close to, so we only trust the shortest Euclidean distances because they're close to the, the uh, geodesic distances on the surface. And those are the ones we are after. So this will be a situation where we want to estimate the distances on the surface. There's been a lot of work on that, in particular uh, ISOMAP in 2000, an important paper in that area. There's also a tight connection with uh, motion planning uh, in robotics, although they tend to operate in uh, more complex spaces because they take into account not only position, but also other information uh, available on the robot, like uh, and constraints such as uh, you know uh, speed orientation, acceleration, and such. Okay, so let's consider uh, a, a subset, which again should be seen as a surface really. Um, at this point, it can be abstract in some uh, Euclidean space and uh, in principle, high dimensional Euclidean space. And the intrinsic distance, essentially what people would call a geodesic distance in other settings, um, is just simply what you think it is, which is that you constrain yourself to be, to remain on S and otherwise find the shortest path on S joining two points. That's one way of phrasing it. And uh, what we have again is we don't have the uh, surface S itself. We have uh, a point set on the surface. And our goal is to estimate those uh, intrinsic distances. So again, G denotes the intrinsic distance on S. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, we're gonna use graph distances. And in this case, because uh, well, we don't really make any particular assumptions on S except for later on smoothness. So we, we are sort of bound to operate locally. And the way to do that in this context is to uh, look at 
the graph distance within a R bald neighborhood graph uh, built on the point set. So same setting as before, but now we are in a curved situation. Okay. This uh, parameter epsilon uh, indicates the density of the points on the surface. And uh, so this was already proved by uh, Bernstein and all those are the Isoma people. Uh, actually, Bernstein was brought in to, I think, help with the proof. It was the, the person wasn't part of the uh, co-authors in the uh, the famous Isoma paper published in Science magazine, but um, the anyway, the they worked on proving that the method worked in this thing, somehow left unpublished clinical report, which is actually quite great, quite a good paper. But um, okay, so they came up with this sort of bound uh, essentially by limit. Uh, more or less elementary, taking things from scratch. And what we did was uh, we, um, we generalized, so in this paper, we generalized it and we also reproved it using uh, classical results by uh, Dubins in the 1950s on, on essentially the early uh, investigations on, on, on motion planning. Uh, and, you, um, and we were able to, to prove essentially the same result they had. Um, Okay, so uh, let me walk through, through this result. We have uh, so some very mild regularity conditions on S, and uh, we do assume that the uh, shortest paths on, on S have curvature at most kappa, which is essentially the case when S is a submanifold with uh, maximum pointwise curvature kappa. And in that case, uh, we have this bound right here. Okay, so uh, R, remember, is the uh, connectivity radius. And uh, yeah, so yeah, sure. So there's also, um, so R cannot exceed the reach. The reach is not only bounding the, uh, the curvature locally, it's also bounding uh, how much you have to jump to uh, go from one area of the surface to a completely different area of the surface. And uh, since it typically, I don't have a picture here, it's typically uh, represented by a ball neck. So it would be like the, uh, uh, the width of the uh, ball neck. So it would bound the width of the bottleneck if there is one. And if R is sufficiently small compared to all those things, then uh, we have this bound. So this was uh, bounding uh, the uh, the uh, shortest path distances on the R or neighborhood graph by essentially uh, one plus uh, something on the order of epsilon over R uh, times uh, the uh, intrinsic distances. And now this one gives you the other way around. Okay, and we have uh, so a bound in R squared on this side. Okay. <clears throat> so that's for uh, you know, the estimation of uh, interesting distances using graph distances. Everything sort of works the way we would expect. Uh, what's a bit no, more novel in the paper we have with Thibault is uh, on our estimation of uh, shortest path distances, but when the paths are constrained to have curvature at most some number kappa. And I got interested in this personally because of uh, with previous, uh, like previous work with a, a student on using this sort of paths to try to unfold uh, self-intersecting surface. So it was like a, a variant of manifold learning, but when the surface is allowed to self-intersect and the goal was to, well, still the same, to embed it in a Euclidean space, to so find a uh, parametrization, in other words, uh, despite the fact that it can self-intersect. And so we started looking at uh, curvature constraints or paths, or uh, yeah, uh, paths like as the map does, but with uh, curvature constraint. To, well, anyway, I won't go too much into detail, but can, you can ask for more information later. Did it turn out to be useful, although the problem remains hard, and as far as I know, we were sort of the only ones tackling it. And, um, so anyway, so but in, in the abstract, we can at least consider this problem of, uh, so now it's the same as before, but now there's a subscript kappa um, so uh, we're looking at essentially shortest paths, but uh, with the constraint among the among those paths that have curvature at most kappa pointwise. And uh, so we want to again use uh, um, shortest path distances on the graph, but now we, of course we have to move. Oh, actually, it's not quite. Of course, at, at the end we'll see that's not necessarily the case. But uh, in principle, we like to uh, come up with a notion of. 
curvature for polygonal lines. And polygonal lines is what you get when you consider uh, short path distance on the graph. The, the corresponding paths uh, in Euclidean space are, are polygonal lines. And uh, so there are, we discovered there are a number of uh, such quantities in the literature. Um, and uh, the one we found most useful is this one, which I think perhaps the most intuitive as well, uh, where uh, for a triplet of points, and the order here matters, to the, to, I mean, to the effect that Y here uh, being the center matters. And what you do is, I think I have an image here, yeah. So imagine that Y is this point right here in the middle, this will be X and Z or the other way around, doesn't matter, but the Y here is in the middle. And what we do is, uh, we, even though this could be in any dimension, when we have three points like this, there's a unique circle that uh, goes through them, at least uh, as long as they're not uh, aligned. And, and uh, in that case, we take uh, one over the radius of that circle to be the curvature. So that's true as long as um, the angle that uh, the segments make here is obtuse, okay? If it's uh, square or, or, or less, then uh, we just uh, define the curvature to be infinite. Okay, so this one is particularly handy for us because it has this uh, simple but uh, desirable consistency property, property where if we fix a curve uh, that's twice differentiable, <coughs> For which therefore we can uh, define a curvature point-wise. Then if I fix a point somewhere, so if it's parametrized by A and B here, and I fix a point uh, somewhere between A and B, and then I approach that point, so can, if you see it as a curve, as a geometric object, the point is gamma of S, and I approach it on both sides of the curve uh, uh, by points, then the curvature in the middle, the way it's defined uh, just in the previous slide, uh, converges to the curvature uh, of uh, that curve at that location. So that's uh, obviously something we will want. Okay. And we were able to prove something better. This one took a little bit of effort, but we actually prove a uh, non, so this one is, uh, you know, as, you know, I approach, uh, the, uh, as the, the point in the middle is approached on both sides, and uh, that this one is uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Like we can actually bound, so it's not an equality though, but we can bound the, the curvature of three points on a curve, uh, as long as they're not too far away from each other, uh, by the curvature on the curve, pointwise curvature on the curve. And this is the key result. Yeah? Um, what, what goes wrong when you have the angle be acute or square? Yeah, so then it doesn't make as much sense to have Y in the middle, in a sense. Let's see if I have the, yeah. So if, hmm, that's where perhaps I could use my tablet. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. So, um, Okay, so if you have, um, okay, so if you have three points like this, this would be y, say, and that's uh, so y, x, and z. Actually, um, so um, if you define it this way, the the circle here could be the uh, the circumscribing circle could be small, but. Uh, uh, later, the way we use this, we want to bound the curvature along the polygonal line, right? So here, if I if I don't, uh, if I just say it's one over the circumscribing radius, the curvature at y should it would not be too uh, too small. Uh, sorry, it wouldn't be too large, right? But here, I want the curvature at y to be large. Okay. Yeah. Right, because the circumscribing circle. I mean, I'm going to do a terrible job here, but um, it's something like this, right? That will be sort of the circle that goes around. Right, and it's not particularly. I mean, the, the radius can be quite large, right? So the curvature could be quite small at y, even though y here should have a pretty large curvature. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, the the, the art is not particularly uh, precise here. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see if I can. I have to stop sharing. I think. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome.
Um, it's, by the way, here it doesn't have to be at pi over two. It can be almost anything because we want essentially uh, in our analysis we're going to restrict ourselves. We, we're going to make sure that the paths uh, with some trick. We're going to make sure that the paths have links that are they have a, a large angle, like a, a very obtuse angle between them. But uh, this would be at least uh, this would be a bound here. Otherwise, like I said, you run into trouble uh, when using at least when using the curvature in the way we intended to use it. Anyway, so we, so then armed with this uh, lemma in particular, uh, we regular so we're essentially able to do what we want to do. But uh, for technical reasons, uh, we're actually not sure if it can be avoided or not. But for technical reasons, we use uh, not a ball neighborhood graph. We use an analysis neighborhood graph in which uh, we keep. So the edges that are uh, of length less than or equal to r are kept; they're available, and then the ones that are less than or equal to r over four, something like that, are uh, removed from the graph. So it's, it can be seen as a, uh, as regularizing the graph. Um, so we do that uh, mostly for technical reasons. And now, like I said, uh, we are we had this notion of discrete curvature. So now we can uh, consider shortest path distances in the graph. Uh, among so defined only using uh, paths which as political lines in space have curvature at most kappa and and then we are able to compare the two uh, so again our goal is to estimate the intrinsic distances with uh, a curvature constraint so I want to estimate g here g sub kappa now I am able to define the discrete equivalent or at least analog and then now I have an upper bound and lower bound. So the upper bound is essentially similar to what we had before. Uh, I just need a little bit of leeway uh, in terms of uh, the constraint I put on the uh, uh, the, the polygonal lines, the, the uh, graph uh, paths. So a little bit of leeway. This is close to kappa. So kappa prime is close to kappa as long as uh, r and epsilon are small. So I want r to be small and epsilon small relative to r squared. Uh, we have no idea if uh, epsilon of r square being small is uh, is uh, needed or not. Past epsilon of r small is enough. We don't know. And we have a bound that looks very much like the one we had before in the uh, flat situ uh, in the unconstrained situation. And uh, yeah, and in, in the other direction, you're going to see that the result looks a bit different. So this one does not require much at all. It's possible that this actually is infinite on this side, and that's why uh, this this doesn't come with any condition on S really. But now uh, we're going to assume that S is uh, smooth enough, in that um, the shortest paths on S have curvature at most kappa. And uh, this is a case, for example, if you, if S is a compact uh, connected C2 manifold, manifold with uh, with boundary that's either empty or also C2. And in that case, we can take kappa as being the maximum of the uh, curvature on S and the curvature on its boundary. But there are strange things that happen. Actually, the, the theory of this was uh, is, is surprisingly complicated um, and has been investigated in a series of papers by Alexander collaborators, for example. OK, so here's the, uh, the result that sort of completes this one. So again, here we have a bound uh, give, uh, so, uh, bounding the uh, shortest band distances on the graph with the intrinsic distances on the, on the surface. Uh, I'm talking about the constrained ones. And in the other direction, uh, in principle, we would have to have the other way around. Right? We would like to have this here bounded from above by something that involves this. Okay. And it turns out we can do a bit better than that. It turns out that uh, the unconstrained source path distances in graph already have uh, curvature at most something that's essentially kappa plus something on the order of epsilon over r cube. So at least as long as epsilon over r cube is small, which again, we don't know if it's uh, optimal. Uh, but as long as epsilon over r cube is small, then uh, this, the unconstrained choice paths in the analysis graph, that's important, uh, already satisfied the uh, curvature constraint. So therefore, the other side of the bound comes from the, we can, we can get the, other, the, the reverse inequality essentially from what we know about uh, unconstrained paths. Okay. 
Any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to go very fast over this next one, which is anyway ten, only tangentially uh, related, but. Um, I, I, uh, I worked with a very talented undergrad student uh, who came for uh, a visit, actually was a master's student, I guess that's the equivalent. Uh, and what we did was uh, looking at constructing random paths with uh, smooth realizations using uh, this sort of notion of uh, discrete curvature. And what we did was, um, so this is a sort of uh, realization that you get out of this process. So it looks pretty, I mean, we are pretty happy with the way it looks. So if you try to smooth some, like say if you take a grand motion, so here we're gonna be in dimension two. So if you if you take a grand motion dimension two and smooth it out, you see that you get some, not something that looks like something nice like this, which uh, you know has um, a good amount of randomness and is smooth uh, at the same time. I don't have a picture here, but uh, you can go to the paper. We have some pictures where it's, it doesn't really do what, what you hope uh, a smooth random uh, path would do. So what we do instead is uh, we, um, okay, let me actually walk you through since I, I have you here, but I'm gonna go a bit fast. So I have a sequence of theta, which those are gonna play the, the role of successive angles. I start with the uh, direction space. I draw a new format at random, for example, and then I update uh, the direction by uh, essentially rotating uh, b uh, using the angle theta at that stage, okay? and uh, and each each time I, I take a step of length one, and then I consider uh, essentially the resulting polygonal line. Okay, so again I take a, a step of uh, of length one in one direction, drawn at random, uniform at random, and then I I, um, I take another step of length one, uh, making an angle theta. Uh, theta j, I guess, with the previous uh, the previous um, segment. Okay, so that defines the if I if I take n steps, that defines the polygon line, which I then parameterize uh, as I do here. Okay. So uh, we actually in the paper we did, we we looked at uh, you know what can kind of conditions can we have on the angles so that uh, the resulting path has what we want which uh, to look something like this we want a finite curvature and uh, and it turns out that we came up with this is the simplest model that we came up with which is a uh, essentially a, a random walk on on the angles and. Um, so the construction is essentially that uh, random walk on the angles, and when we have that, importantly, the angles for the uh, the uh, innovations, uh, they are uh, between minus alpha n and alpha n as well. So actually, I say it right here. Okay. Okay. So if that's the case, and alpha, and then we have this uh, limit, importantly, so n cubed times alpha n squared converges to a positive constant, then we have a, 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 a continuous time process limit uh, that has the sort of property that we want. Uh, it is twice differentiable, in fact, continuously differentiable. It's actually a bit smoother than that even, but, and then uh, it's already, as represented here, you need speed parameterized and uh, its curvature at time t is, uh, is, is bounded and actually bounded by, uh, sorry, given by uh, this quantity here, two thirds kappa times uh, the absolute value of bt. So let me just say a few things. So u here, so xt is the, um, the polygon line we talked about before. That's our uh, discrete process. And then uh, the, 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 the process converges to is, uh, has two random components, so u, which is uniform at random in the unit circle. <clears throat> And independently, we have a brain motion dimension one. Okay. This i here is a complex i. i squared is equal to minus one. Okay. So that's. Uh, Can I ask you a question that? about this or potential yeah, go ahead. Uh, things? Uh, uh, so, go ahead. okay. Let's say I want to build like um, curves that have constant curvature, right? So it seems like the right thing to do would be to consider second order Markov processes, right? Like you need to actually take into account three points if you wanted to do this. And um, so I guess my uh, uh, 
my question mm -hmm. would be like, uh, do you know what would like, do you have any, okay, so I guess this particular Markov process, this particular continuous time process is not particularly intuitive to parse, but do, is, are these things like studied in the literature if I actually try to get like uh, 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 continuous processes or even curves with continuous curve with a constant curvature? So, uh, I mean, if the curve is in dimension two, if it has constant curvature is a piece of circle, right? So is this what this would converge to? No, right? You would actually flip the direction every once in a while, though. Yeah, yeah. so it doesn't have constant curvature. It has uh, finite curvature. Did I say constant? No, no, you said finite. Okay, so it has finite curvature, uh, but it's... Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so here actually the maximum curvature, is, so T runs from zero to one, so the maximum curvature is essentially proportional to the maximum of a brilliant bridge. That's essentially what the, the maximum curvature is going to be. The point-wise, we have a... An actual, it's, the process is simple enough that you have uh, an actual uh, formula for it. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, constant coverage in dimension three, possibly. Then that's what you're talking about. Like when you actually have, a, I don't know if it's possible or not, but um, yeah. So anyway, so the extensions are possible, but we didn't look into dimension three or more. But that's possible. You could, in principle, have uh, you know, like make it nice so that it looks nice in dimension three. So that's you know, like uh, in dimension three, you have curvature. You also have the torsion to take care of. Yeah. And uh, we haven't looked into that. We we thought about it, but we already had uh, enough in our hands to to, to do something. So that's okay. what we have this for. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Of course, there's much more sophisticated theory. I mean, very sophisticated theory in in random surfaces in, instead. That's you know Scott Sheffield and his students. Uh, that's a whole different level, obviously. Uh, here, uh, in the, you know, it's relatively simple, but we didn't find anything uh, of that sort in the literature, surprisingly. Well, that looks as nice as this. All right. Like I said, it was a bit tangential. Let me come back to a more uh, statistical flavored problem, which is, again, it's means distances, uh, but based now on uh, just the adjacency information. So now, uh, up to uh, just ignoring this last uh, project, which I, in fact, liked very much, but uh, the other ones, we had uh, uh, weighted graphs, right, which we were dealing with. And uh, now uh, let's just assume that we only have uh, the unweighted graph available to us. Can we still do something? And I have to go a bit fast because I'm running out of time here. So um, but at least let me explain the basic premise and, and jump to the, the main result we have. So like I said, we have available adjacency information uh, and the graph will be undirected here. So uh, the model we are assuming is a latent position model uh, in which, um, or sometimes called latent graph model paths, uh, in which we have points in space that are unknown to us, x1 to xn. In fact, that's what we want to recover. Those are, in fact, the parameters. Somehow the dimension is denoted by v in this particular setting, but just ignore that. And uh, our model is the following. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's an edge between i and j, given the points, uh, with probability phi so a function of the distance between the, the corresponding uh, positions in space, okay? And then phi here is gonna be uh, uh, non-increasing, uh, of course, with values in zero, one, uh, because it's, uh, it's gonna number probability. This is sometimes called a linked function statistics. So for example, it's, quite, it's similar to what uh, generalizing model, how generalizing models are defined. So the same vocabulary could be used. And we assume that uh, the, otherwise the, the, uh, the agency uh, entries are uh, independent of each other. Okay, and we can deal with the case where the link function phi is known or, or unknown. And the goal is to estimate the pairwise distances. We know that once we have the pairwise distances, then we can use classical scaling to embed the points. So our goal uh, can be defined as being this. There's some literature on the topic. Um, including uh, perhaps the most relevant paper somehow was this link prediction paper, which uh, almost by uh, by coincidence we uh, found it. Um, but actually, uh, is very closely related. But there, there have been some studies on, on this problem, and uh, including on some so-called dot product graph, random graphs, which are based on inner products as opposed to distances. Okay. And uh, so again, we're going to use graph distances to uh, estimate the underlying you can distances, but here uh, something. So uh, like I said, we can use we can deal with the fact uh, sorry, with the situation where the link function is uh, unknown. 
uh, and in that case, the scale is sort of lost forever. So not only uh, we cannot only recover the points up to rigid transformation, in fact, up to similitude. Okay, but otherwise, uh, yeah, we can we can deal with uh, the case where phi is unknown. And in, in any case, we're going to use uh, graph distances to estimate the, uh, the the underlying distances between the points. The simplest case is when phi is the step function. So it's one if uh, the distance between two points is uh, at most r and zero. Otherwise, so this is the uh, random geometry graph uh, setting. And in that case, uh, so it works as intended. So the d hats are r times the uh, the Schwarzbach path distance in, uh, based on the adjacency matrix. And uh, we have, a, you know, uh, a performance bound on that that looks very much like what we had before, and we also have a, uh, a information in a sense lower bound uh, that matches it. So that's the simplest setting. This is a pr uh, proof of concept. Uh, we have those are the latent positions, and uh, this is what we recover with uh, various uh, entries for R, or values for R. And as before, uh, convexity is crucial because you know if these are the latent positions, so they're not dense in their own convex set, then those are the estimated uh, positions. That's essentially the best we can do here with with the graph distances. And we are able to extend this beyond uh, step uh, link function, uh, but very crucially, uh, phi has to become zero uh, at some point. So it has to have some compact support. That's very crucial. I can say, so actually you can do things when that's not the case, but uh, you have to do other things. Um, and anyway, so we also have a result on this that now depends on how fast, so alpha here dictates how fast uh, phi approaches zero, and that alpha appears right here in the rate. Okay, and that actually that concludes my talk. Sorry, I was, I think I'm being a bit uh, over time, but anyway, thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? <laughs> I had a question going back to just the classical scaling algorithm. Uh, I, I guess in the setting where all the distances are known, yeah. uh, how do we know when the graph can be uh, reconstructed? I'm assuming there's a uh, yeah. pair. Yeah. So, uh, if you only given pairwise, uh, even sometimes they're called even dissimilarities because it can be more or less anything. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go back to it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you can obviously implement this uh, on a computer, right? But uh, if it happens that some eigenvalue is negative, mm -hmm. then uh, then it, uh, the the the, set, the point set cannot be realized exactly in a Euclidean space. I see. So if you have like a, a slight perturbation of your points that makes your eigenvalue negative then yeah that's possible yeah but so so two things about this one is that you can use that to uh, actually uh, deal with the case where you're not provided with an embedding dimension mm -hmm. okay but often i mean this at least was developed for visualization purposes and uh, often d is equal to two in practice frankly loop of three so that's one thing to know but um and so when that's the case, uh, you just cut at two and then you have this portion. Even if you have points that are exactly embeddable in dimension 10, but you know, if you cut at two is the same as with PCA essentially. And in fact, the two methods are somewhat related, but the one works with these similarities, the other one works with a set of points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, if you have a little bit of noise and some of the eigenvalues are, may, may become negative. Right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So maybe uh, uh, it's Philippe again. One quick question: um, Does your last model with the uh, link function? Do you know if uh, it has some connection with these generalizations of uh, Bradley Terry loose models that uh, people have been studying for uh, learning from pairwise comparisons? Yeah, from uh, uh, like rankings. Yeah, that's right. So the name yeah. that comes to mind is uh, so Shivani Agarwal has, uh, has some work on on, on multivariate versions of uh, of Bradley Terry Loose, for example, some a bunch of generalizations. So I wondered if this was connected. I, okay. I know it's directed, so maybe there's something different going on there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not aware of uh, high, higher dimensional generalizations, but typically the embedding there, my understanding, at least in the more classical setting, would be an embedding in dimension one, 
right? Because you presume a uh, you know a complete ranking, right? And then uh, so in that case, um, yeah, I think that's a nice connection to make. Yeah, yeah. I think so. It depends what model you consider of rankings, but the uh, the, the more parametric ones are exactly of the form I just showed. Yeah, they have a link. You know, I mean, you know this better than I do, but uh, they are. You know, you have a link, a link function uh, based on on the positions, and the positions there are are essentially real numbers that dictate the pro, you know uh, essentially the the um, the rank of the of, of an individual if uh, we're looking at individuals performing tasks or that sort of thing, right? Or, or competing against each other. Yeah, so there's a link, but my understanding is that um, uh, most of that, that work is in dimension, embedding dimension one. Otherwise there's a, uh, a relationship also with ordinal embedding. So ordinal embedding is also a classical, at least dating back to the 60s by uh, from, like uh, Chris Cole was one of the early researchers there. People were interested very early on in, it's the same, similar with rankings in that uh, they were interested in, in embedding points based on comparing their distances, right? And this is uh, obviously useful when there's no, when the notion of scale is subjective, right? So you ask some person to compare mu musical artists. So you say, is artist A closer to artist B than closer to artist C, right? And then you try to group all this information to actually embed artists in, as points in dimension two, again, for visualization purposes, right? And that also has a long history. I have done some work on that. And uh, it is related to this um, because it can, <coughs> Okay, it, it takes me to a, a bit farther, but so let's see if I can make sense of that. <clears throat> so the more complicated situation here in the last very last setting, the very la the, the 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 crucial uh, assumption we make in our work is that phi become is compactly supported. If phi is not compactly supported, then uh, it becomes uh, more tricky because you have you have very long edges now and then, right? You have some sort of background noise. So imagine that uh, phi is non-decreasing, right? So uh, it's, let's say that at infinity converges to 0 0.1. So it means that no matter the distance between the points, you have a probability of at least 10% that they are connected, right? So then therefore you cannot use graph distances at that point. So what people have done before, and that's the work on link prediction, somehow people are, uh, had thought about that in, in link prediction, is that they uh, they sort of denoise the graph in a sense by uh, looking at how many neighbors two points have in common, and that sort of provides a um, some sort of uh, no uh, measure of distance between points, right? But then, in particular, when phi is unknown, you have to sort of all all you can hope to get there is ordinal information. Okay, so that's why that's that's where there's a link between uh, this project or this problem, and and the ordinal embedding. So there is a relationship, but we didn't push it in the paper at all. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Any other questions? Sorry, I had one more question actually. If there's time. Yep. Um, so uh, in the case where some of the distances are not given to you, uh, I was wondering if you did something very naive, like just uh, randomly sampled from a Gaussian and replaced the distances that you don't know, uh, and then applied classical scaling, or, or essentially chose some way of replacing those missing distances such that the eigenvalues of this, um, of this matrix are, are positive. Do, do approaches like that work? Um, I'm not aware of it, but the second method seems um, I don't know if it's computationally feasible or not. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. So there has been worked on, you know, like you can see this as uh, a low rank. So the distance, the distance matrix is a low rank. And um, assuming that it's, uh, the, the, the problem is exactly solvable in a low dimension. 
then uh, then what, what, when some when some entries are missing, you can approach it as uh, you know like a matrix inference when some entries are missing, mm -hmm. right? And people have done that. They've done like uh, they input some values. Like I think zero is like a favorite. They input a value for the missing entries, and they literally just do SVD or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Which is essentially what you're recommending, right? But the uh, so I, I think you get you can get somewhere with that. Um, but the uh, it, I think it's going to fail in situations where you only have uh, uh, clo the closest distance available. I see. But if the distances are missing at random, I think that's essentially relates to the work that people have done in uh, low low -link matrix recovery when entries are missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a relationship there. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Perhaps we should uh, wrap up and uh, thank Aria. I don't know how to do it. We can un unmute ourselves and uh, clap. All right. Thank you, Aria.